don't take it. You want this end or uh, the, Yeah, because we need to. Gave everybody else a handshake. Hard to get to the side. Good morning. <laughs> Do not disturb. All right, good afternoon, everyone. As uh, the mayor and his team are getting settled in, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with uh, the budget hearing for Tuesday, June 6, 2023. Uh, I'm Councilmember Alex Wan. I'm chair of the Finance Executive Committee. And this is the final week of the FY24 budget briefings for the City Council to review the mayor's proposed municipal budget for FY24. I'm currently joined by my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Jason Winston, Council President Doug Shipman, and Councilmember Matt Westmoreland. Uh, there's Councilmember Jason Dozier and Councilmember Howard Shook, who's vice chair of the committee. Um, so I want to first thank everybody for the accommodation of a, a change in schedule for today due to uh, the late proceedings of yesterday's full council meeting. Um, so the revised schedule this afternoon will begin with the executive offices right now, and then we'll have parks and recreation come in at 2 o'clock, enterprise asset management at 3, and then grants and community development at 4. And then we'll take a break, and then we're back at it at 6 o'clock. Um, to 6.15, the millage rate public hearing, and then 6.15 to 7 o'clock, the interactive budget hearing. Uh, for those that are watching uh, online, uh, there's an electronic copy of the budget book and all presentations uh, thus far under the proposed FY24 budget tab on the City Council website. Just go to the Finance Executive Committee page and also on the City's website uh, under the Finance Department. Uh, I'm going to ask Council members if you will allow the mayor and his team to finish their presentation, which you have a copy of first. I'll start a list of those that want to ask questions. Um, and I believe that's all the announcements I have for today. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to hand it over to you, introduce your team, and then walk us through your budget request and get ready for questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good afternoon, council members. I want to uh, first just thank all of you for being here today because uh, yesterday, Monday, was a a long day that carried over into this morning to 5.30 or so this morning. And so it was quite a long day, long night and morning for each of you. And so I just wanted to thank you for being outstanding leaders. Thank the clerk, uh, the city council staff, the CFO, the uh, law department, uh, our dean, uh, Department of Enterprise Asset Management that was here throughout the night, um, the Atlanta Police Department, Atlanta Fire Rescue Department, our emergency prepare department, even Channel 26 being here this whole time, uh, and then my team uh, directly, Ms. Burks, Mr. Uh, Pace, Mr. Donald, Ms. Gordon, and as well as um, uh, Mr. English, and so many others, the ex executive assistants that stayed here for quite a long time. So we had a, a, a lot of staff uh, in this building, and uh, folks were working hard, and I uh, respect the public and um, was um, Pleased that you all voted to approve the budget for the Atlanta Public, Trace, Public Safety Training Center. So thank you for your actions there, uh, council members. And uh, when we decided to become public servants, we, um, you know, did so because we believe strongly in our communities and, uh, you know, and the things that we do definitely have uh, consequences and a role f for all of our families in this city. And so your vote will help to make this city a national model. Uh, for what we plan to do in terms of uh, progressive training for police and uh, social justice and police reform. And so that's why I just want to take a few minutes before we got started to say thank you. Thank you to Council President Shipman and thank you to uh, Finance Committee Chairman Juan as well as the entire City Council for your diligence throughout this entire budget process uh, that we've had uh, so far. Um, and so uh, with this budget, as you guys have seen, we intend to double down as an administration on the progress that we've made over the past year and a half together uh, with City Council and our entire teams uh, that you see behind me. Uh, this is commitment that we're making to make Atlanta the best place in the nation to raise a child. As you know, we've been listed since the last time I stood here and talked to you all. Since then, we've been the best place to live by a number of places, but they're talking about the best place to start a career, the best uh, place to travel to. All these things have happened, uh, but we still want to be the best place to raise a child. And so the city is investing in our future. Uh, the city is in excellent financial shape with strong credit ratings and the largest reserves in our history. So we are ready 
for the future. What you are going to hear today uh, from this administration is prioritizing our support for the city's young people and making strategic investments in public safety, infrastructure, and economic development. This is our agenda, um, and uh, we, are, we plan to stick to tight, trying to get through our part so that we can receive your questions. Um, and then as we go to slide three, you see my vision uh, that we've been operating under one city with one bright future, a city of safe healthy, connected neighborhoods, and with an expansive culture of equity, empowering upward mobility and full participation for all residents, embracing youth development, and an innovative, dependable government moving Atlanta forward together. That's the vision. And so uh, I, I thank you all for being here, and thank you uh, for joining us, uh, Council Members Overstreet and Norwood, uh, as we've gotten started. And uh, before I go to the four pillars, I did want to just uh, make you aware that everybody behind us uh, are in the mayor's executive offices, and they are the best people to work with. Uh, they get the job done. They support me they support our efforts as a city so i thank you all for being here and um you guys are the ones that uh, really uh, drive a lot of the activities that we have in this city so i thank you uh, so uh, we're going to talk about the four pillars that we uh, operate under one safe city a city of opportunity for all a city built for the future and effective and ethical government. And so now we'll turn it over uh, to Ms. Gordon, our COO, to carry us on from here. Good morning. Uh, we are excited to see you again. It was just a few hours ago that we uh, all were here. And so, yes, it's afternoon. So, I, I, yeah, <laughs> we are together. Yes. Uh, Exactly. As the mayor says, it's a group project, and we're pleased to share some highlights from FY23. We're excited that not only were we able to plan last year, staff yes, last year, uh, but we were able to really execute on a lot of the shared goals that we have um, with the Dickens administration and with the city council. So a few highlights from our One Safe City. You know, there were significant investments in public safety. Uh, we've allocated the $15 million for our E911 system. Uh, we also know how important that is, our first nest sentence system, which allows us to have additional technology uh, for that system. And we know that um, Chief Sherbaum and his team always tell us about guns, and we confiscated close to 3,000 guns last year. Uh, one of the things that's most important that citizens and all of us can do together is the camera network. And we had more than 13,000 cameras um, integrated in our system, and many, many of the crimes that were solved last year um, were due to that. We also are pleased to light up our city with more than 11,000 street lights, and we also launched a first um, nightlife division, which allowed us to have more coordination on the nightlife in the city that we want to be vibrant, but that we want to be safe and uh, insulated to some of our communities. Um, we also right now are, are pleased that we are seeing a, a significant reduction in crime, which I know that you've been made aware of. As it relates to our city for opportunity for all, just want to highlight a few things from this slide. Really the investment in the future as the mayor um, spoke about, we placed over 3,000 youth in employment roles um, and paid them. They need a salary, they need to work, and they need investments. We were able to have a million dollars um, granted to over 23 nonprofits uh, that serve 6,000 youth. Uh, we've expanded a lot of our cultural planning. Hopefully you were pleased with the Jazz Fest this past weekend, and there was also an investment of $1.7 million in grants um, to nonprofits, as well as the acquisition of the West End Art System through our partnership with Fulton County. The most important thing we've talked about is workforce development, um, and there's been a $1.8 million investment in La Atlanta Technical College and to help us with that. There's many other things, and I wouldn't be remiss if I didn't mention the acquisition of 2 Peachtree Street, which is our largest um, investment um, as we redevelopment, uh, redevelop that building. And Courtney English was instrumental in that work. Um, a city built for the future is how we're investing in our infrastructure. We're pleased to report that we've um, acquired over 268 uh, acres of new parkland. Uh, as you know, our airport is expanding. It's still the number one airport and busiest, most efficient in the world. And we added 13 new international uh, destinations, including the most recent, uh, with was Ethiopia Airlines um, and the non-stop to Addis Ababa. 
We've invested over $619 million in capital improvement projects. That's fire stations, investments at the airport, and infrastructure across our city. One thing that we haven't received before is being recognized as a climate action leader in the first, for the first time in the city's history. We want a future for our, our youth that is built on a strong environment. We've talked about this more than once. Our potholes are coming in at 10,600, which is a $3 million investment, and continuing to have safe um, drinking water is something we're very proud of. I think one of my favorite um, accomplishments of our administration is our effective and ethical government. When we came in, we got a lot of feedback from the public, from city council, about what we need to do to have a strong uh, financial organization. And as you know, we are a, a AA plus for Moody's and A1 bond ratings. We also have cleared a lot of backlogs in our city, including the backlog of 11.5 million in HOPWA funds. We have completely uh, renovated all of the work internally in our procurement um, department. Pleased to say we're at about 130 days and we were upwards in some cases of 300 days or more, um, including a, a 511 days in one case. Um, our cycle time was reduced from 10 days to 2.3 hours on our procurement side, and that is part of what integrates across our city to allow us to do our business. And I remember us having a very robust debate about procurement with a, within a few months of our administration, so I'm pleased to see that we have moved beyond that to where we're even doing um, further um, reforms around procurement. As you know, we successfully in invested $88.4 million in CARES funds, uh, for compliance and federal funds, and we were recently awarded an additional $20 million from the state based on the work and our, um, ex our experience of utilizing those funds. We were um, very excited to keep our city together as we move through the legislative um, session, and we're looking forward to everything that we're going to do. The mayor's going to talk a little bit about our 24 uh, budget priorities. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Ms. Gordon, for highlighting just a little bit or a lot bit of what <laughs> occurred in FY23, uh, and uh, we did it with you, uh, City Council. We did it with this team that we have behind us. Uh, so a lot of the things happens in operational departments, but a lot of the movements uh, take blocking and tackling from intergovernmental affairs, international affairs, cultural affairs, uh, and so on and so forth. So these uh, offices help to uh, navigate and make these things happen. Of course, uh, the uh, revamping of constituent services, et cetera, these things allow us to uh, get work done. Of course, the new policy office uh, that we have. And so the budget priorities for FY24 for the executive offices um, is still the same with one safe city, a uh, city of opportunity for all, a city built for the future and effective and ethical government. We're talking about more take-home cars that first ever take-home car program in the city of Atlanta's history has been successful and we're going to invest more in that going forward this year, uh, replacing aging equipment in public safety so that uh, we can get more uh, support for our public safety personnel, a city of opportunity for all. We're expanding and adding an at Promise Center uh, in, the, in the Southwest Corridor, uh, expanding affordable housing opportunities, and uh, the year of the youth is a academic year, so it uh, teeters over FY23 and FY24's budget. Uh, city built for the future, Department of Parks and Recreation, Operation and Maintenance. We heard loud and clear from the public and this council about investing in that and then technology and innovation enhancements. We plan to continue down this road of improving our financial position, and one of the ways to do that and increase our budget is to save money, and that's by being more innovative and using technology. Uh, and an effective and ethical, uh, ethical government, expanding our current reserves even more and staffing, uh, 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 staff development and training to make sure that we have uh, well-equipped staff and personnel to do the job of the city. So now. Uh, we will go on to a little bit of our specific priorities for uh, FY24. Uh, is that you, Mr. Donald? Mr. English. Oh, Mr. English. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Mayor, uh, Mr. Chair, members of Council, uh, Council President. Certainly a pleasure to be with you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, One Safe City uh, is going to be a primary focus, a continued focus of this administration. Uh, that will include uh, continued investments in both policing and non-policing uh, activities to ensure that each and every neighborhood across this city 
uh, remains uh, safe. And so, of course, that includes uh, our take-home car program, uh, our E911 um, programming and the technology improvements, as well as the, the ultimate or the uh, construction of a, a new 911 uh, center and continued capital improvements uh, all across our public safety um, apparatus. It includes continuing programs like our court watch program, our public safety uh, interagency task force, which have uh, worked to drive down violent crime and combat the gangs that we have seen um, across the city. Of course, the mayor has already talked about our camera integration and then ongoing nightlife uh, division. The other part, uh, which relates to the non-policing uh, activities, uh, center around our year-round workforce uh, experience. The Summer Youth Employment Program last year hired 3,007 um, young people and paid them uh, an average wage of $16.63 uh, if, if, uh, if, I remain, if, if I'm correct, uh, that program will not only cover uh, the summer, but we intend to expand that program out and it is critical uh, to keeping our uh, city safe. Of course, uh, effective and ethical um, government is critical uh, to our operations. Uh, we in continue to uh, investments into the city's workforce through our uh, call annual cost of living increase, professional development opportunities, and retention opportunities uh, designed to ensure that we are keeping a highly trained, highly competent uh, workforce in place. Uh, the mayor just mentioned uh, realigning constituent services to be a more proactive body uh, working with you uh, in each of your neighborhoods to address uh, constituent uh, concerns. Uh, we have launched, already launched a review of the fees and permitting processes across government uh, to ensure that those processes are delivering for each of uh, your constituents, whether that's licensing, um, permitting, building uh, fees, of course, which I'm sure all of you um, have heard a lot about. We will continue investments in those areas as well. A city with opportunity for all, ensuring that every Atlanta, no matter who you are, where you look like, what neighborhood you were born, you have the opportunity uh, to thrive in this city. We're going to expand uh, our strategic partnerships uh, initiatives uh, to ensure that we are not, pace, uh, not only only uh, building a city that works for everybody on the backs of the general fund, uh, but we're going to do this together. The mayor always talks about Atlanta being a group project, and so uh, we've created a, a process and an apparatus that allows us to partner with both the private and philanthropic sectors, but as well as our local community organizations to ensure um, that uh, we are building a city that works for everyone. A uh, big example of that we just mentioned is the Mayor's Summer Youth uh, Employment Program. Uh, we're going to continue to combat food Food and security. Uh, one of the measures uh, that you all uh, graciously passed last night was designed uh, to that effect to ensure that neighborhoods have access to high quality food and will continue to leverage public private investments into affordable housing. As you know, uh, we're on track to uh, raise $300 million for affordable housing. One of the other initiatives that was passed last night was the passage of a $100 million affordable housing bond, as well as $1.4 million to ensure the citizens have access uh, to affordable housing efforts, as well as uh, combat the, uh, the ongoing uh, combat of slumlords. Finally, a city built uh, for the future. We're going to prepare Atlantans for careers uh, through the full implementation of the Atlanta Department of Labor and Employment Services under the direction and leadership of our Chief of Staff, uh, Mr. Odie Donald. We're going to deliver on long-standing and new transportation infrastructure projects citywide, both those approved by Council and then, of course, uh, those uh, that we have to work in tandem with uh, our partners over at uh, MARTA. Uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, there's going to be a renewed focus on increasing pedestrian motorists and bicycle safety uh, citywide and ensuring uh, that those efforts uh, move forward so that we reduce um, uh, the number of fatalities we see and also increase connectivity uh, throughout, our, throughout our neighborhoods. With that being said, I believe I will turn it over uh, to Chief of Staff Donald to talk about our org chart. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, I think you heard a lot of the great activity that's happened through FY23, and I think the mayor has really given us the vision and had the opportunity of the last fiscal year to really shape the government in the way that, that he would like to see it. Uh, we've talked about the uh, addition of the Chief Policy Office as well as uh, the Department of Labor and Employment Services. But there have been some other additions that I think have really helped to uh, 
increase the uh, our capacity, but also really streamline our operations and service delivery. Uh, we initially had the Office of International Affairs as well as Welcoming Atlanta under the mayor's vision. We have combined that to really augment those efforts for uh, areas of diplomacy as well as um, helping some of our most vulnerable residents. And I think uh, you'll see um, with the lifting of Title 42 and the more than $7 million or the approximately $7 million that that group has brought in, we're actually prepared more so than many other American cities to deliver. But we're also doing so with less people um, within that division because we've been able to, uh, I'm sorry, office being able to combine those offices, elevating the, off the chief sustainability uh, officer to a cabinet level uh, uh, position as well as many other efficiencies that the mayor has put in has really helped us kind of streamline our operations, deliver quicker and faster, but at the same time be able to do so in a cost effective manner. And so when we look at uh, our budget in comparison to previous years, I think we wanted to kind of dive into the meat here. Um, I think it'd be fair to say when the mayor came in, he kind of was in the midst of a fiscal year, which was FY22. So FY23 really served as the mayor's first year to be able to implement his vision. And an apples to apples comparison is really looking at FY21, uh, which was kind of the height uh, of the previous administration before they start ramping down and we started coming in. When you look at that, um, which we have exemplified in this chart, you'll see that across administrations and comparing FY21 to what we're proposing for FY24, despite uh, factors like inflation, increased personnel cost and our implementation of a COLA and other things <coughs> to satisfy our workforce, we still actually come in at our peak at about 27% lower than that final full year. Uh, plus, during that first four year service, I think you've seen us ramp up and actually implement some of the activities of the mayor, including appointing a senior technology officer, the creating the creation of the chief policy office, as well as the elevation and expansion of those areas that I uh, recently just mentioned. Did all of those things while also placing departments and offices under the right uh, budget lines, including I think corrections was included in our FY23 budget. We've now align them appropriately with operations and public safety. So when you see those changes, you'll see that our budget still really comes in much lower than some of those previous years. In addition to that, when you look at our head count, it also has right-sized that um, in FY23, the office's personnel budget really served as a baseline for staff allocations, but there were a lot of uh, funded vacancies and, and areas that we really needed to take advantage of to staff up. But again, I think that uh, piece of corrections that I mentioned and some of the other uh, positions that were included in our budget that were actually really um, should have been allocated elsewhere with the different additions from the mayor as well as the creation of the chief policy office despite all of those enhancements and innovations and our increased ability to deliver we're actually really flat on the uh, on the personnel numbers again that's because we right-sized um, and put those those uh, allocated those areas to really where they needed to be and then move from uh, extra help model to really ramp up to having more full-time employees that's best exemplified on this slide. When you look at our overall personnel budget, there is an increase of 3.2 million. We don't want that to be deceiving for you because 1.9 million of that is making sure that we take care of our employees. I think you heard from the mayor in his first budget is that he was putting people first and putting people uh, putting people first and, and doing so always. And so uh, that 1.9 million, of course, was for our frontline workers and everyone else, but it also impacted the mayor's office and so we have an increase of about 1.9 million and then we have the creation of the chief policy office which has a cost of about 1.3 million in addition to that as we know in this economy fuel cost uh, and vehicle maintenance has increased a little bit and I think that's also um, a kudos to our partners at DPW who have appropriately um, started to price maintenance and so um, you'll also see a slight increase which is nominal of about 92 
$2,000 in FY23 uh, around our, uh, our budget there. So we wanted to make sure to capture and incorporate that as well. With that, I think one thing that is extremely important, which all of these efforts really highlight, is that our mayor has really not just looked at the general fund as, as many people in our public often do, but he has looked at, you know, how we really approach this government to be built for delivery and a city of opportunity for all without increasing that burden on the backs of our taxpayers. And so when we look at our government, we try to do so uh, in being as efficient as possible, leveraging the general fund, but not overburdening it, over it and then also making sure that we look at other resources and outside partnerships to be able to do that delivery and with that I'll turn it back over to the mayor yeah thank you thank you team members for uh, your portion of the presentation and I'll round out this and then go to your questions the whole of government approach is essentially just that we don't just look at the general fund we don't just look at um, you know the enterprise accounts we look at everything that we can get our hands on from ARPA money to CARES money to uh, philanthropic contributions to support from our federal partners state partners uh, we are looking up and down all over for how we can resource things that we want to do together uh, to move the city forward so we acquired more than 250 million dollars in additional resources uh, to augment housing transportation, workforce development, infrastructure, and parks uh, outside of the general fund. So uh, we talked about this last year that a lot of times everything is caught up on this one a particular fund, but when you add another $250 million on top of it that comes from other places besides the fund, you can really essentially um, do 25% more work than just what the general fund can do. Um, if you think about the relocation of 800 plus residents from substandard housing in District 1 at Forest Cove, that did not take the general fund, but it will uh, definitely impact our city from a safety perspective, a, uh, a human dignity and human rights perspective, as well as the ability to now begin to redevelop a portion of our community that's been uh, significantly forgotten over years. Uh, the creation of the city's first housing help center to assist residents in navigating affordable housing options. We create, we put out all this money in affordable housing across the various Atlanta housing, uh, Invest Atlanta, the housing offices in the city, and people still say, I don't know how to get an affordable unit. So now we have a housing help center uh, that will be able to navigate you through finding uh, your place to live. The creation of um, a number of things that we've created over time, and then you think about how uh, with FEMA, $6.8 million in federal funds uh, in humanitarian efforts, as was mentioned, uh, for this Title 42 lift that will have to happen, uh, leveraging intergovernmental relationships uh, that have led to $100 million in federal funds. $100 million in federal funds, also the intergovernmental relationships with the state uh, to help thwart a, a de uh, an annexation, de -annexation uh, movement that occurred, which keeps our city whole and makes our lives easier. Uh, and then just other things uh, that's going to bring in that lost revenue, uh, the, the local option sales tax that we negotiated heavily on behalf of residents of the city of Atlanta that can really, um, that, that, that you're going to see the benefits this year and beyond this next next 10 years is going to be phenomenal because of the hard work that was done by this team. So when people come to the Jazz Fest, when people come to the NLC conference that we've won here, uh, when people come to the college football playoffs that's going to come here, when people come to all these tourist destinations that we have, we get extra revenue to be able to do the work of the people because we did good negotiations and uh, we've had, we have team members back here that are working hard to bring uh, all these things to bear. Uh, so on and on, we use the whole of government approach, uh, the relationships with our school system, relationships with our county partners, the relationships with our federal government and our state partners to be able to leverage additional funds, additional support. Uh, you, you, you just can't, um, uh, can't really uh, say it enough how drawing circles has really, imp has really impacted this uh, city and uh, really made a big difference. Last thing I'll show you is, um, you know, I'd spend a lot of time around other mayors across this nation at the U.S. Conference of Mayors and various other places, and everybody wants to be a part of Atlanta. Everybody wish they were Atlanta. At least that's what I'm going to say right now. Uh, they're very envious of what y'all what y'all do here. Uh, not last night. That was a lot of work. Uh, but 
they, they see the results of what you guys are doing. And $12 billion is what we manage. $12 billion when you add up all these funds, the pension funds, the enterprise funds, the general fund, the special revenue funds, debt service funds, as well as the capital projects funds that we have, the Moving Atlanta Forward Infrastructure uh, Package, all of those things, huge amounts of money that we have to manage and procure and get out the door and make sure we do it ethically and equitably. And all of you and all of us are committed to that. So we are at $12 billion of assets managed. That's a huge amount of responsibility, and I take every last one of those dollars and every last one of those funds into consideration into the delivery of the services that the city needs uh, now and for the future. So I thank you all, and I thank my wonderful team that's behind me. Um, and again, for those that just came in as council members, I did, and I'm going to hand it back to you, Mr. Warren, but I did say earlier, I commend you all for uh, a long day, a long night, an early morning yesterday. Hard decisions were made. And then you love this city enough to show right back up today, a few hours later, to come here and listen to and to uh, get into discussions around the budget. You're really showing how much you care, how much you love this city last night and beyond. So I thank, I thank you for your leadership, and I, I, I enjoy serving with you. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Warren. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Overstreet, uh, Norwood, and Lewis. Uh, and I also want to point out that your final slide is a picture of Council District 6. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, already buttering me up, um, I will go ahead and start a queue for questions. Uh, I've got Dozier and then Shook Norwood Lewis. And Shipman, Council Member Dozier, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Donald, Ms. Gordon, Mr. Inglis. I appreciate seeing y'all. It's like I see y'all more often than not, but uh, <laughs> it's good to see y'all in this chamber, in this room. Um, I just had a couple quick questions tied to this kind of same issue, uh, thematically at least. Uh, this past weekend, I was just in Washington, D.C. for a conference for uh, Truman National Security Partnership. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I know you chair Truman's work around state and local diplomacy. And one of the things that I've been really uh, thinking about a lot, especially after this weekend, is what we are doing as a city to, to champion that work or to continue to champion about that work and what's reflected in this budget. I really appreciate Paulina and Vanessa and their work that they've been doing with, with that office, but just recognizing that the World Cup is right around the corner. I know we did the... Uh, uh, I wasn't able to, to join you on that flight to Ethiopia, but I uh, appreciate the city's work to build relationships with those channels, but just thinking through where there's opportunities for Atlanta to play an outsized role on this issue. Uh, I just, if, well, if you could unpack that a little bit and, and talk about where that might be reflected in this budget, considering all these big international things that are happening with this city and that's the world on Atlanta. Yeah, thank you for that question. And um, I'll, I'll have Ms. Gordon talk a little bit about the Sports Council and the work that's taking place with FIFA World Cup. But um, we have a dynamic executive director and team of intergovernmental and international affairs. Diplomacy is at the hallmark of this city. We are a busy international city, and people know it. Uh, 100 ambassadors or consular corps members come to this city to meet with myself or you guys or you know anybody here uh, each year. Last year we met 100 of them, and they are coming here, of course the world's busiest airport, but also the cultural uh, understanding of equity and opportunity and just how fast the city is thriving. They want to work with us on, on, on technology initiatives, they want to learn from us on transportation, of course with the airport, et cetera, um, but they also are interested in how uh, we run this government um, in a city-state relationship that we have. Um, everybody doesn't get afforded the opportunity to look across the aisle and get things done. And so um, I think uh, in preparation for FIFA World Cup, in preparation for all the things that we're doing, uh, we have consolidated that office and put a dynamic leader in, on, in charge of it, and, and we really uh, meet on a frequency and, and, and talk about city-to-city -city diplomacy. So the State Department has normal, normally been the uh, engine of diplomacy for the United States. Well, now cities are all connected by technology, and they see our sustainability, and we see their sustainability. We see their 
transportation and technology, they see ours. So now cities are talking to each other. I can have a full conversation with uh, Johannesburg, with uh, you know the, anybody, uh, Addis Ababa, of course, in Ethiopia. We are actually at the table having conversations about how to improve diplomacy and uh, how to make sure that um, we continue to uh, bring down violent crime and also prepare ourselves uh, for you know, national disasters and all those things. I mean, it's, it's a full breadth of conversations that we have. And then I'll turn over to Ms. Gordon and just talk a little bit about World Cup um, and uh, the sports council that she's a member of and the preparation for that. Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon. <laughs> Council Member Dozier. I think you remember where I'm at. Um, the Sports Council, um, one of their functions is 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 helping with um, attracting large venues like um, the World Cup to Atlanta, as well as, well as some of the um, some of the other large sports events. But one of the things that the city has um, going for it is that we have the largest, most efficient uh, airport, and so all around the world, people can come here. And then when they get here, all of our um, hotels and all of our infrastructure connects together. So it creates a very good experience for um, anyone participating in the event as well as people visiting our city. So that means it makes us very competitive. We still are gonna find out which games we're gonna get by the end of the year, but we suspect that we should be in very competitive because we also have the, the best state-of-the-art facilities for uh, players to play in and almost around the world people want to come to Atlanta and so we've distinguished ourselves just our infrastructure our logistics our airport our economic development and then when people come here they really have a great experience and so we've gotten um, additional venues back sooner than normally is in their cycles. So we continue to um, do things to make sure the city um, is prepared for those events, um, back to one safe city, um, a city for the future, having the infrastructure in place so that we can really be the best in the world. So yeah. everyone wants to come here, but I would just say that we've gotten a lot of uh, feedback. And something we heard um, on the sports council the other day is they said the World Cup is um, like, 10 Olympics, if you put it together in terms of the economic development and people there, and the, and the comment was that if you look back 20 years, it will be the biggest event, and if you look forward 30 years, so in a 50-year history, when we bring that event here, that's the type of event it's gonna be, and there's lots of opportunity for economic development, not just for the event, but for our entire city. So we are working at, on a strategy to make sure that we really leverage that opportunity. And then I'll finalize because I know we got other questions. We um, are going to stand up a subcommittee under the Sports Council specifically around uh, making sure that the World Cup just doesn't just happen to Atlanta, but it happens with Atlanta and that we have activations leading up to uh, the World Cup. So. 2024 preparedness for 2025 mm -hmm. so that we'll have lots of games maybe scrimmages and you know outdoor festivals and things that uh, make sure that these communities and these small businesses throughout each of your districts and, and quadrants of the city can have uh, some pre enjoyment of World Cup and then once the games are here everybody can't afford these expensive tickets but to be able to have uh, watch parties and things we're going to establish that with some of our creative communities of course soccer in the streets and others uh, the last thing I'll say with under Vanessa Barr's team and the international affairs. They work closely with our uh, emergency preparedness office, Felipe Denbrock. Uh, he is constantly talking to uh, all the alphabet soups, the CIA, NSA, uh, uh, FBI, about national security and our local security. And so together, they work on those, and we have community navigators that have just been established to get the word out to community members that in, are in English as well as uh, other languages through our I Speak ATL. Thank you, and I appreciate you adding to about the subcommittee for the Sports Council, because I know 30 years ago we had ACOG, and I'm not saying we need to bring Billy Payne out of retirement, but just wanted to make <laughs> sure that, you know, these efforts are coordinated. I know I saw Commissioner Cutler in the back somewhere, and, you know, we, there's a lot of opportunities to promote the game, promote the sport, maybe even facilities enhancements in our park systems. I've had several conversations with Sanjay about how, what we can do about watch parties, soccer in the streets. At Station Soccer in West End is one of their flagship sites, it's, as yeah. well as Five Points. And I know even with Five Points, there's coordinations with Martin about what the future Five Points Martin Station looks like because I feel like the development community is all racing against the clock to make sure we can be ready for the World Cup and just wanted to see what 
the administration, what the city's doing on the same front, because I know that 2026 is right around the corner. This budget is going to take us into 2024. And um, so this, that's why I'm really interested in this work. I know time is short, but yeah. um, I'm, I'm excited. And, and I think just going back to the conversation about diplomacy, there's just such an opportunity to make to open our city to the world in a much bigger way. As you talk about 10 times the Olympics, uh, but just don't want to miss the, the opportunity that's before us. So. Yeah, thank you. I know this uh, council has more United season ticket holders than any other, <laughs> than any other city council we've had. <laughs> Mr. Warren, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, question about your personnel budget, and anyone in this room is welcome to correct me if I'm wrong, but as I recall the original pitch for the Office of Policy, it was supposed to be budget neutral. So my question is, is this 1.3 a reallocation of money that was somewhere else in prior year? I can answer that question. Yes, um, <clears throat> the 1.3 is a reallocation from the planning budget to the uh, exec office budget. And so the planning budget, when you look at it on a year over year basis, um, we, we shored back up the planning budget as well too for additional needs that they needed for fiscal year 24. Thank you. Um, how is this administration's iter iteration of court watch gonna be more productive, informative, effective than those managed by prior administrations? No, thank you for that question. This time we're working with Fulton County, uh, the city of Atlanta, Fulton County, as well as the sheriff's office are all promoting this together and uh, DA Fani Willis is committed to it. So our uh, DA as well as our chief of police connected on this. So um, the amount of folks that we just graduated a class of court watchers, uh, about about how many of them? 100. Yeah, it was 100 of them that we just graduated three or four weeks ago. They have been watching court Court, as they should and giving their comments to the judges so uh, we're utilizing technology with them as well as in person I think that's helping uh, because in the past you had to actually go to court court watch now with uh, technology you're able to kind of do it online so we hope that the results will continue to make sure that proper sentencing is taking place well yeah that's a great goal um, I hope it works the courts are not the easiest things to watch um, <laughs> and then finally it appears as though there's going to be a property tax increase in this budget, which is kind of startling to those of us who have been here a minute. My question is, is the administration looking at other ways to find the money to enhance park operations? And I'm a huge supporter of that goal by perhaps instead of raising property taxes, trimming one or more lower priority activities. Uh, thank you for that uh, question. Yeah, so, you know, we haven't increased the general fund in a number of years, 13, 14 years as uh, teammates as we've been. Uh, and, you know, this parks uh, millage rate increase is one that I have the CFO talk about because this is a priority for this administration as well as for the council to improve our parks maintenance. So with regards to the parks millage uh, um, increase that is uh, as a result of a charter amendment that is passing through council right now which is on second read uh, that charter amendment <coughs> increases the uh, city's commitment to park maintenance as well as uh, investments from a half a mil to a full mil there is a public hearing tonight at six uh, o'clock to talk about the mill rate appropriations so as we develop the budget as we monitor the budget when we see things that um, are impacting the city charter, we put we do incorporate that into it. So um, there will be a public discussion on that tonight and based on how that legislation goes, that will carry what the uh, park mill would be set at for the next year. When was the millage rate first established at a half? Um, ooh, it was over 30 years ago. Yeah, so we're 30 years ago was when it was first at, at that point today. We feel like the need for parks is the amount of people in the city has grown, the amount of folks that utilize our parks, the amount of aging equipment we have, that this is an appropriate uh, time as consistent with council as it's going through you guys' uh, process right now. And also, I, I may add, the um, assets that are managed by the Department of Parks and Recreations have increased significantly over the last five years. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shipp. All right, Councilmember Norwood, followed by Lewis. Okay, several things. Um, uh, the transportation infrastructure, I mean, as y'all know, and as we've heard as we've been out in the community, and it's not your fault, uh, no one did a good job of maintaining our roads over a dozen years um, or more, but certainly in a dozen years. So we have streets that are absolutely crumbling, and I know y'all are working to do that. In the, in the bond in TSPLOS, there was only 3.5 million, I'm sorry, 3.5 percent, which is I think about 26 million, um, that was street repairs. There was 90 million in complete streets, which is a laudable goal. But for those of us who are in environments like Ms. Overstreet and I am, um, and for uh, a good part, Mr. Shook, we don't have the infrastructure for that. We don't have the, the built environment for that. So, um, as you know, last year I was asking about impact fees, and so my request is, um, and the council is, was very concerned about the transportation budget, because, it, you know, we know that, that all of this work you're doing is really good, but what our people want to know is, when is my street going to be better? When are my yard trimmings going to be picked up? When, you know, those just basics, and again, you're coming from a position of a lot was not done for a long time. So, but my request would be between now and the time we adopt the budget, that we take a close look at those direct services that we can say, we were gonna do X, but we now can figure out how to do X plus Y. That would just be really helpful. Um, the second thing is on the affordable housing. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity, point of personal privilege. Um, I'm working with Livable Buckhead to put together the employer assisted affordable housing program and I am contributing a significant amount of personal funds to get that off the ground. I am contributing $40,000 so that we can get all the legal work done and get that rolling. My request to you today, and, and it's not a budget item but it's important, is um, as we have this housing help center, if we have a three-legged stool, which is the point, the employer has to say, I want this employee to be able to live close. The apartment um, or condominium complex would say, I will draw down, I will do a reduce, reduced um, rent uh, to this person. And then the third would be either foundation and or the city in just a stipend each month. And when you run the numbers, the cost of building new, which they were saying at the regional forum last week, was twenty-five dollars to $40,000 each affordable unit. We can put a lot of people near their work if the city thinks about making sure that with this help center, this is one of those um, initiatives that, that deserves consideration. Because I think we can do, I think we can be a great force very quickly in having people be having more volume for affordability um, for individuals because it's not that huge upfront cost. Yeah. So that was my second one. So please tell me who in y'all's departments we ought to be talking with. You're going to talk to uh, Courtney English. Mr. And just English. To, and Thank just to you. A, a firm. Okay. I agree. Okay. I, I, we are all in on employer, uh, employer supported housing, employer based housing. Uh, it's a phenomenal program. I mean, essentially, the city of Atlanta's uh, work that we're doing with the police and fire department by giving stipends. We are employer uh, supported housing in that regard, uh, and we want to make that accessible to all of our, uh, to more and more of our staff. But Buckhead has a lot of Buckhead throughout the city. Our hospitals, et cetera, they have lots of employees that still have to drive in each day. So uh, I am all in on that. If we can uh, get the, uh, as you call it, the three-legged stool. Uh, the apartments lined up with the employers and then to find a, a way to stipend it that's the financial thing that we'll have to do but the first two I think we we can get miles and miles down the road on wonderful thank you okay Councilmember Lewis and, second. and mayor to stay on that point I, I think my first thing I ask would be uh, closer to that because I, I love that idea but thank you mr. mayor for uh, for today when I look at your budget, I know you crossing all your T's, and it's always better to hear from you. And so uh, my question on that was, in District 12, we have a lot of, a lot of, I call it gold. That's the land. We got Jonesboro South, 
uh, Jonesboro North and Pool Creek, uh, Gilbert Gardens. They sit in our district, all city on land. So I would like to see, not this year, I know that uh, right now we, we're set for this year, but to look at next year with $300 million uh, that the city get more creative in the housing. We get more sweat elbow and create our own housing again because workforce housing we can do and I got the, we got the, we already got all the gold uh, in the district. So I, I always talk about myself and council member uh, Winston's district because Leela Valley and Thomasville, all that stuff is still, a lot of stuff is still city on land and if we want to do it, we can do it at a price that it can really work. So I would like to see, I know you are the mayor that could probably get that done. I know it probably take next year when we get it. But I want to do that as soon as possible. Absolutely. I want to dive right into the year of the youth. Uh, I heard you say that we're going to try to keep it going all year. Is that something? What, what does that look like? I, I love that idea, but what yeah. does that look like? So I'm going to answer both of them, and, and they actually both uh, go into uh, Mr. English's shop. So city-owned land and, and District 12 and across the city, we have an assessment of every city-owned property and, um, you know, related property, whether that's Atlanta Public Schools or uh, Atlanta Housing Authority, Land Trust. So uh, we would love to invest some of this $300 million into your district if there's, if there's projects that are, you know, shovel-ready uh, or shovel-worthy, and we know that there are some. And so let's get together on those things with uh, his team. And so Courtney can speak on that as well as how long will the year of the youth go? Um, you know, I, I, I may keep it going for eight to 20 years. I don't care how long. <laughs> but um, it would be, be like, uh, you know, just, uh, just it. That's what it is. Every year is the year of the youth in, in my eyes. But um, specific to the funding that we have and to the uh, supporters that we already have uh, raised money from, uh, it's uh, this, this academic year plus uh, another half year. So, Mr. English, you can speak on it. Certainly, um, as it, I'll take them in, uh, I guess, reverse order as it relates to uh, the year of the youth uh, and just highlight um, that the investments you have made, uh, we've leveraged them, the $5 million investment in early education, the mayor turned that $5 million into a 20 million, actually a $22 million uh, investment in early childhood education, which will benefit uh, the citizens of uh, Atlanta for generations to come. Uh, the youth development grants uh, that was a $1 million investment that you all made yes, uh, last year. The mayor intends to, to double down on the investment and in, impacted 6,000 young people. 6,000 young people um, across the city. Uh, over the course of that time, we've seen uh, a vast reduction uh, in youth-related crime, um, and it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing when uh, a parent loses their child, and candidly, there are too many parents who are losing their child, uh, their children to gun violence, and so we're gonna double down um, on those efforts, and you'll see us roll out initiatives around creating additional safe spaces uh, and additional programming for our young people. As it relates to affordable housing and development of public land, uh, for far too long, you had, uh, a, candidly, a housing authority that just wasn't in the business of building housing. I'm not I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. Uh, what you've seen uh, throughout the course of this uh, administration in the last 16 months, as of, I think, three days ago, um, uh, you've seen the development or uh, the development process start for Bourne Homes. You've seen the development process start for the Atlanta Civic Center. And two weeks ago, uh, the Atlanta Housing Authority dropped five simultaneous RFPs to develop public land, including uh, Thomasville Heights uh, and a number of properties uh, that touch your district. So uh, we're coming. Uh, there's a project that we're working on that's in your district right now that it, it, that is, I believe, either adjacent to Jonesboro South or it might actually be Jonesboro South, uh, but uh, we're coming. Um, we're coming. Okay, and I, I think on the year of the youth, uh, Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. I know the, and I'm speaking mostly about the jobs because right now everybody's hitting us up for jobs, and I appreciate you wholeheartedly for doing that. Uh, the last job fair, uh, it was at the same time as uh, Briage's funeral, and so a lot of students, as you Anybody who was there, they saw how many people were there. Yeah. I know I've reached out to see if we can have a, another job fair because we, I've, I've been getting DMs for kids who were at their funeral who just couldn't make it there, and then they still want that opportunity. So I know I've reached out to the staff, but I, I know I'm not talking to you. I get a, a real fast answer. <laughs> but, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, I would help. We could do it at Roselle Fan or CT Mar or at the Work Sales Building. Okay. I, I would volunteer myself to be there if you need more help. But I would like to get one going uh, so, between the next two weeks. 
I know yeah. we got enough staff out here to get yeah, it going. Yeah, they're, they're telling me that we have another one at Paula. You want to talk yeah. about when that one is, Mr. Do you know yeah, exactly? Yeah, I, I don't have the date for it, but we've been doing orientation at Pollard all this week, kept the online portal open so those folks who were not able to actually come in person could still um, go online to the QR code. I saw you post it, so I know you have that one. Uh, and then we'll have an additional, actually two additional opportunities, but the mayor's also uh, launching the Mayor's Youth Leadership Institute where there'll be slots for that as well, which is also a uh, paid work experience program as well. So even if they don't start at the beginning of the six weeks, which is actually now, we still have another four to six week program embedded in the summer program that they can participate in. So short story is not over. Use the QR code, but also you can contact me um, directly as the proxy to the mayor, and we'll make sure to get you straight. And that one at Pollard is in... Um it's an MPUV. I don't know if it's, that might be four. It's so close. I sent some kids down there today to Dr. Stephen Lee, and they got a job within 10 minutes. But Excellent. it wasn't that. I just wanted to know if yeah. he was going to do a job fair so we can just uh, flush them all down and not send well, Let's look at doing Dr. another Lee. job fair. I mean, yes. we can talk yeah, because I know Dr. Yeah, Lee's probably getting a lot of folks down there. It's, Lastly, it's uh, Mr. Mayor, I, would, I okay. appreciate you for bringing that program back because I needed it so much as a student. Yeah. So I know how much uh, this is affecting young people today. Some folks are making more money than their parents are uh, because of this program, and I appreciate you for that. Uh, lastly, uh, the you, you, you've been drawing a lot of circles. It's one thing that I that this council has passed that didn't make it into that circle. And that's the this year in your uh, be, in your speech you talked about two two thousand nine hundred and fifty eight guns confiscated, and we passed a gun lock box ordinance here, and I've been asking about it for a while. I know. Uh, and they said from the ARPA funds. So I want to know if that's a way you can put this in your budget or is there a way we can get these? Because people, they're reaching out and they say, when, is, when are you going to have these gun lock boxes uh, for folks? I know we passed it here. So what do we have to do to actually get them in hand? Uh, is there, did it come with funding for it or what is uh, the, the, so what is the gun lock box? Yeah, yeah we, uh, we passed the ordinance in city council about uh, on, date yeah, don't matter, it's been a while ago, but we passed it and asked for ARPA funding or however, uh, you can find it, but we know how bad it's needed out there because you just said 2,958 guns uh, getting confiscated okay. in cars. Uh, last week at Pittman Park when the pool opened up, uh, a lot of folks don't know, we caught a 13-year-old young man with a gun. We didn't arrest him. We took the gun from him. And, uh, yeah. and we, we, we took the gun from him. He handed it right over. We did not arrest him. We let him go and, swim, and finish swimming, actually. Yeah. Uh, he gave it to us. But we so, need these gun lock boxes. I have a nephew who just went to jail for breaking in cars uh, for guns. And so I know how this goes. Yeah. I need those gun lock boxes. I got a niece that just got murdered a week, you know, a week ago. And you help raise her. So wow. we need the gun lock boxes. We know these are stolen guns out of cars. So that's the one thing I want you to throw into that circle for me. Okay, I got you. So my team is telling me we'd have to find funding for it. So we're going we're gonna to put our heads together around that. One creative way may be how we just uh, work with Kia. Um, Kia and Hyundai had an 830-some percent increase in uh, cars broken into and cars stolen because they don't have that. The 2011 to 2021 Kias do not have the anti-theft mechanisms that's necessary. So we're handing out clubs. We're also, uh, I've, I've called Kia to our office. Kia has met in that, in that, <laughs> in my office and, and called to the carpet on this saying, you know, uh, you're costing us a lot of money. Uh, our police department keeps chasing down folks, uh, having to arrest folks, having, uh, and, and you're costing insurance to go up for families because they now have a neighborhood that has a high concentration of cars broken into or, or stolen, and they're all majority Kias and Hondas. Kia, we came up and told Kia, uh, not only do you have to do more clubs, and they did that in District 1, District 4 has distributed them, and you can go to any uh, police uh, precinct and ask for how you can get a club if you have a Kia or a Hyundai, but also I've asked them to hire summer youth to do the software update to Kias and Hyundai. So we now have a, we're going to have a date in July a series of dates where if you have a Kia or Hyundai and you're a citizen of Atlanta, you can drive up and in 15 minutes, somebody will come do that new patch, which installs the anti-theft and Kia is paying for it. I use that as an example to say, maybe we go to the gun manufacturers and say, you buy us gun locks, lock, lock boxes, um, so that, you know, you make the guns, you can make the lock boxes in a city that definitely needs them. So that's one way to do it. Uh, and we'll continue to look for other ways to be able to be supportive. Um, now, not only are we working on 
what happens once you have a gun. Our goal is to make sure you don't have a gun when you're under 18, to make sure you don't use a gun when you're uh, any age uh, unless it's necessary. So this administration is uh, focused on anti-violence, it's focused on anti-retaliation, it's fo focused on conflict resolution, and certainly focused on gang reduction and gang total elimination. Um, and the leadership uh, is, is where we're starting with it first. And so while, while unfortunate situations such as the, the death and the shooting of individuals that you mentioned is due to guns, we're going to attack the guns and we're going to attack the nature at which people uh, participate in such activities and have too easy of access to guns and a mentality that puts them on a pathway to either hurting someone or getting themselves hurt. And so that's what we've been successful at this first half of the year is uh, altering the mindset of, towards violence. Got to do more and we'll keep doing more. I, mean, I want to tell you I appreciate you. Uh, everywhere I go, people tell, tell me they appreciate you. We support you. I like this budget that you put forth. The only thing I want you to throw in there is that what you just said. That's why I put my pie up in the sky when I talk to you. I appreciate you again. All right. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mayor, team, it's good to see you. I want to start with um, saying, uh, following up a little bit on Councilmember Dozier, it's good to see you, but it's not uh, that we don't see you and your team often. We do. Um, when you came into office, you said that you wanted to work collaboratively with the council. Um, you and I talked about that personally, and it has been true. Um, everybody on this stage and many people who are in the audience from your senior team, you return calls, you're open communicating. Um, even when we don't agree, we still talk. Um, right. And I think that's a really important point. Uh, I often tell people when they ask, you know, is it really is it really as collaborative as it seems? And I say the rumors are true. It actually is collaborative. So I, I want to start there because I think that that was a really important commitment that the voters wanted to see back in 2021 when this new council was elected, you were elected, and it's not only you, but it's the entire team. So I want to, for myself personally and on behalf of the council, I want to say thanks because we see all of you very often and we talk very often and it does not go unappreciated, but it should go acknowledged. Um, I just have a few questions. Um, I actually want to start with your vision and or the administration's vision on a couple of things. One is the Labor Department. This was something that, that you had talked about. Could you just talk a little bit? We have it in the budget now. What do you see it doing? Maybe draw a little bit of a distinction between it and human resources just so we can sort of see what the, uh, what the parameters of the office are. Yeah, so I'm glad you said that. But I want to go back to the first point. I got uh, 99 problems, but a council ain't one. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> y'all make my job easy. <laughs> y'all make my <laughs> <laughs> Very delayed. Very delayed, Mr. Oh. West Wallen. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, th I'm thankful I don't have war stories or war wounds from the relationship with the body, the governing body of this city. I mean, this is where I came from. I, I, I uh, learned a lot alongside half of you, and I've spent a lot of great moments with the rest of you that are newcomers. Um, so I, I, love my, I love my relationship with the council. Our team enjoys working with you all, and the people back there are the ones that get a lot of the work done with you. Um, so uh, going to um, talking about the Department of Labor. So yeah, it is a difference between the Department of Labor and Human Resources. And uh, the distinction is there are labor unions in our city government that need to make sure they have a voice and, the, and to have a, a access point. Some of that is through HR. Some of that is through the uplifting of just labor in general. And then other outside of the city of Atlanta's government, there are labor unions that are doing work that uh, needs elevation and access points, whether you're talking about uh, construction that we're doing across the city. So those various unions want to have their voice heard and be a part of all of this uh, infrastructure work that we're doing, all this affordable housing that we're building, all of these, um, uh, all of these uh, new jobs that's coming into the city. Uh, this is a part of our workforce. And if we want to, uh, one way to fight 
affordable housing is you can build more housing or you can make things make people have more money more income and so that's why labor is important not only is it labor unions but it's just the workforce development part of it so summer youth employment pro pro program is actually under the labor department um, and uh, when we go out here with a senior technology advisor uh, and we uh, work with a major corporation whether that's Walmart or Cummings or uh, you know the future of Microsoft we have to help them develop a program that trains our our citizens to get those great jobs that mechanism doesn't happen in HR because HR is dedicated to employing people for the city of Atlanta's 8,500 positions but if Microsoft comes with 10,000 positions I want at least half of them to be residents and I don't want them to import all their talent from the West Coast so how do you train folks how do you make sure that these programs uh, work mr. Donald you want to add to that no, listen, I think you you hit the nail on the head, Mayor. I think the only thing that I would add is that, you know, when we look at uh, what we have in WorkSource Atlanta right now, they focus on solely the training um, for the most part of our residents and preparing them for an array of jobs. The Department of Labor, under the mayor's vision, adds that, I mean, nationally, labor unions and our labor organizations are the best training grounds. And so he is, one, incorporating them into our training training apparatus, but also adding some of those resources that just add capacity. So he mentioned Kia back during my time with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. We started Quick Start and, you know, actually trained all of Kia's workforce. But what the mayor's putting in place will allow us to do that right here in Atlanta, making our economic development efforts and our workforce development efforts really combine for the first time and being able to respond to both our citizens as well as our employers. Uh, thank you. Just to follow up on that, uh, Councilmember Bakhtiari and I have been working on uh, a way in which we could institute greater incentives for training and apprenticeship programs in our contracting. So I just wanted, I know we've been working together, but I, you know, I'm hopeful that we can find a way to, to get that legislation because I agree with you. I think that, that making sure that we have that sort of internship program, whether it be within the unions or just more broadly, yeah. would be huge. I, 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 uh, as a council member, I created a policy that did not finalized because there's some you know you got to be delicate about the the state that we're exactly. in and the union uh and the uh requirement but uh, i have a you can talk to amber robinson and well you can talk to mr theo pace he was a uh, uh, instrumental in helping me with that he still uh, knows about the policy that we wrote which was for on the job training for contracting and apprenticeships and when you have a moving Atlanta Ford infrastructure bill that has 750 million dollars that's a jobs program that's the new deal and uh, I would love to work with council on uh, on strategic and creative ways to uh, make sure we navigate uh, state regulations but also get people uh, you know it'd be an amazing thing uh, Councilman Lewis just left but I was gonna say if in district 12 as he's talking about we pave a road and somebody locally paved that road or somebody uh, we're working on that sidewalk program, Ms. Ms. Norwood, as you mentioned. Thank you. Um, one other sort of broader vision, um, the level of reserves are an all-time high. We've talked about that. I think everybody is excited about that. I am just uh, interested in your vision of how high those reserves should go. I mean, uh, should they go even higher? Do you think there's a potential for a bond upgrade there? Or do you say, hey, this is sort of at the limit? I'm just kind of yeah. curious this is a vision because we do continue to see them grow. This budget actually has an investment in them growing uh, next year. Yeah, I'm gonna let Mr. Ballas speak a little bit on it or Ms. Gordon, or, uh, you know, all the people that are smarter than me start talking and tell me hush when I run out of fuel in my knowledge on these things. But, um, you know, mo managing the competing interests of the city is the hardest part of the job, which is we wanna make sure that we have a high, highest credit rating as possible so that our cost of doing business is down so that we can do more. Uh, when you can borrow money at the lowest rate possible, we're almost there. You get the triple A, you be there. Now, you gotta be at double A plus for a long, long time to get the triple A. You don't wanna stop, you can't go backwards and then ever get the triple A. You have to be in that. So the places that are triple A is very few, uh, like the state of Georgia is, but that's because they were at double A plus for a long, long time, and then you get the triple A. Then you're borrowing money and getting a little bit less uh, cost, so the things that you do, you can do even more. But at the same time, you're managing the right now needs of, we wanna do raises, colas, we wanna be able to put more into parks, more into roads, more into these things. So how do we, and housing, and all the other initiatives that we have. So we don't want the reserves to be too large, uh, that they're just sitting there and not 
being utilized. Uh, so I don't, for, I don't foresee us being in the 30, 35% range, um, but I do think where we are right now is a, is a stable place for the potential instability that we're seeing in uh, the economic forecast that's a little bit uh, ahead of us. Uh, we've been riding a nice wave, and I want to make sure that we can weather a storm that uh, may be coming. I don't believe that any you know, prognosticator would say that we're going to see 2009-10 level of recession, great recession, but I also um, you know, want to make sure that we're prepared. Mr. Ball, is there any added or anybody else that's real smart up here want to talk about that? <laughs> I don't know if I'm that smart, man. Mayor, but I, I think it is important to add in that, you know, while we have made it through that at one time every 100 years catastrophic uh, health emergency, you know, we are still in very uncertain economic times. So the impact of inflation for local option sales tax, for example, has really inflated our collections and we're ahead of the curve there, but we don't project that to last forever. At the same time, our costs for carrying and improving our workforce are actually increasing on a regular basis. The cost of doing business from everything to street paving and infrastructure projects is almost about 15 to 20 percent higher than it was just five years ago. And so I think when you look at some of the decisions that the mayor has made in this whole of government approach by increasing our loss collections or, you know, leveraging outside resources to be able to deliver while increasing our rainy day funds allows us to sustain that while also keeping our credit rating and some of those other activities in the midst of those uncertain times until we get to more certain times. And so uh, to the, the same comments that the mayor made is just that right now we know that the right thing to do is to really ensure that we're increasing that credit rating, keeping our coffers, you know, full so that we're prepared for whatever the future holds, but also continue that whole of government approach so that we're not delivering at this rate on the backs of our residential taxpayers because they're actually the ones who are in the midst experience in these uncertain times. Right? Last thing to that is commercial property tax, Ooh, yeah. proper assessment. Um, they're singing the blues right now, and a lot of them are, you know, rightfully so because of uh, the, 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 you know, challenges with commercial real estate vacancies that we see across the nation. Atlanta has actually weathered fairly well with vacancy rates of commercial properties, downtown, midtown, Buckhead, because we've been booming. Uh, but coming out of the pandemic, folks have decided to work from home a little bit more, a certain percentage. So commercial properties that we want to go after to make sure they're properly taxed, that's a revenue source that we intend to really, with your help, and with the county and with everybody involved to be able to find a way to get more money out of that so we don't even have to have a conversation around reserves. We'll just get more revenue to be able to do the things that we need to do. No, I appreciate the final comment, um, and I appreciate your investment in that. Uh, Mr. English has been working hard on that. I appreciate it. And also Councilmember Shook and Juan who have had public hearings and such. I do think that's vital. Um, just a few very small things. The, I noticed on page 12 the fair free MARTA exploration. Who's going to have the ball on that? I think several of our members are interested. Is that ATL, DOT, or who's going to have the ball? Mr. Donnelly, you want to? Yeah, so we have started that conversation um, with MARTA in the mayor's office. So uh, Mr. Otta from Ms. Gordon's team has been instrumental, uh, as well as myself and Mr. Pace, uh, along with uh, their intergovernmental affairs folks from there. So uh, also the mayor uh, appointed recently Ms. Carla Smith, who has also been uh, coordinating with MARTA. So as we do everything, it's a team effort, but the mayor's office is leading the charge with ADOT. So it's going to be a pilot to start uh, that will start real soon. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we'll actually uh, basically put out the parameters for marketing, uh, I believe July 1, and then we will implement beginning August. We want to give people 30 days to sign up, but it is a 1,000 person, well, I don't want to get in front of the mayor's official Don't make news. Don't make news on that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Ain't nobody going to come to my press conference now. <laughs> yeah. Let me stop there and just yeah, say right. uh, <laughs> July 1, the parameters uh, for sign up will come forward. Apologies for that. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. no, good. Thank you. Um, I did want to underline, of course, it's a personal um, passion, the arts and culture commitment. I believe there's an additional 500000 in this budget, as well as the West Side Cultural Center. 
Um, and I know there's continuing to be work on the bond uh, funding and where that's going to be deployed. So I appreciate all of that and con yep. the continuing for that to be a priority. Um, uh, sustainability, uh, you've elevated the office to cabinet level, um, have put more money sort of in to make sure that is, is working. I do just, just a comment, I do hope we can continue to find sustainability dollars, both philanthropically and in the city. Obviously, there's a huge long-term lift there, and there's a lot to be done. So I know that you're working on it, but I'm, I am hopeful that we can that we can really make that a pri continue to make that a priority, yeah. especially around um, water and heat. We know that those are the issues that are yeah. especially going to affect Atlanta. Um, just any commentary on kind of where you see those, if you want to. Yeah, so we have elevated the chief sustainability officer to a cabinet level position and directly reporting to the chief of staff and the deputy chief of staff. And so uh, our goal is to really hit the, uh, the the big goals that we already set, which was 2035 to be 100 percent clean energy, but also sustainability uh, around water, around the various departments. So elevating and hiring the right person, uh, Chandra Farley. Uh, therefore, she's at the level where she can communicate with commissioners without needing introduction, without needing any intervention. Uh, she's at the cabinet level where her conversations matter with the water department, with public works, with uh, parks and rec, with the housing, et cetera. So we plan to be bold and, and visionary in our in our pursuits. Uh, Mr. Donald, you want to add anything specific to? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh one, Ms. Farley has been a breath of fresh air and has really been focused on moving that office forward. And one of the things that she has done along with our newly appointed chief equity officer is that they've joined a partnership with GMA where they actually go after both equity and sustainability uh, dollars and activities uh, together as a part of that, led by Mr. Uh, Brian Wallace, who leads the Hub Cities Initiative. We've also, the mayor has been very uh, instrumental and engaged in the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and there are two sustainability grants for which we're hoping that at the convening in Washington, D.C., we will be able to receive some of those funds. I think you know we came before the council um, for one of those applications, and then the second, we're actually... Uh, in line to, uh, I'm sorry, we uh, were looking at a Fuse Fellow and other things. So the mayor has pretty much both publicly and privately focused on expanding capacity within that office, and we expect to receive additional grant funds while also investing in the office directly himself. Great. Thank you. Um, just a couple other quick things. Um, on page 17, um, I had questions when the budget first came out. I very much appreciate the chart on the left, um, which shows the, the year over year for the uh, headcount breakdown and also year over year around expenses. Just to um, tie that off, um, you answered the question about Councilmember Shook around um, the reallocation from budget to budget. Um, also, is, I see the note about FY24. Is this fully staffed now? Basically, you feel like the vacancies are, are filled pretty much? Yeah, um, so th yeah, we are, for the most part, fully staffed. Thank you all for last year <clears throat> confirming all of our commissioners and these various uh, cabinet-level positions that needed to come before you. It took a lot to hire all these people. Um, so um, we were pulling double duty on certain jobs and still trying to meet the uh, expectations of the public without some of these key people. But now, everything from commissioners to deputy chiefs of staff, deputy chief operating officers, innovators, innovative, innovation officers, chiefs this and that, uh, seniors this and that, everybody's been hired. So we have, we have everybody here, and thank you all for giving us those, uh, uh, you know, we, we had to spend a lot of time in um, interviews and getting folks uh, up to speed and orientations and uh, confirmations. And so now we're, we're about where we're going to be. And, and just to tie that off for the chart, it feels like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like that part of the FTEs going down is that some of these have been made more senior. Some of the folks in the past who weren't cabinet level have been made more cabinet level. That also might 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 be the issue as well with the budget going up a little bit, with the headcount going down, right? So it's a, it's a little bit of a philosophy, right, that sort of more senior folks to be able to have more impact as opposed to more bodies. And that's sort of a fair. So you've got a reallocation, and then you've got a little bit of a re-leveling, and that sort of explains the chart. Is that a fair? Yeah. Okay. The, uh, so I'm going to actually kick it to Mr. Actually, all three of them have done this. We looked at every single position. There was no assumption that there was somebody working in that position. There was no assumption that that person was the right 
role, right fit in the in this mayor's office. So, you know, uh, some people got moved, or you know, you uh, didn't, you know, what was it called? Abolish the head. They got other opportunities. They got other opportunities, or whatever it is. But they they did an assessment because we wanted to make sure that when we stood before you, that we knew who each and every individual was that that, that works in this mayor's office and what role they have, and that they are accountable up all the way to them and to me. So, Mr. Don, did you want to speak on? Yeah, I think one thing is there are less vacancies. I mean, right. you know, when you come in as a new administration, you've got to fill those vacancies um, to be able to deliver. But also, the mayor has been pretty focused and directed us to make sure that we provide opportunities for folks across the government. So you'll see that our uh, deputy chief equity officer actually came from a strategic position in parks, and that is a step up. So we promote it from within. I think we've had folks from our mayor's offices special events who have that specialty who have moved over to procurement to help them deliver on this new philosophy. So across the government, even with the development of the chief policy office where those folks came over from planning to be elevated to deliver at rapid pace, I think throughout the mayor's office, he has made sure that one, people get opportunities, two, it aligns with his vision, and three, we deliver on behalf of our council and the citizens. Great. Thanks. Uh Last two requests. One, <clears throat> as we move towards the World Cup, I know that everybody's worked hard on better state relationships, and I know that the state, for the first time, put in some state money for security related to big events. I would hope that we make that a real priority ahead of 26. Given how big the World Cup is, it's a state impact positive, and I think the state should be helping us with the security uh, and just sort of the overall investment. So. And, and I know that council members are more than willing to help on that, but I think that's going to be really important that we don't bear all of that burden yep. right our, uh, on our own. <clears throat> and the other is you made a very good point about the amount of philanthropic and sort of uh, non-governmental sources that are going to support a lot of the activities. I'd love to see an, just a, an ongoing annual chart that basically is almost like an augment to the budget that says, hey, in I mean, you've got a ton of you know, good things here, but it's sort of hard to follow, okay, how much is going to parks, how much is going to sustainability, almost if you took it like your departmental breakdown mm -hmm. and say, hey, here's the budget, and here is what we actually had philanthropically on top of that. One, I think it'd, it'd be a little clearer of how much impact's actually being made, but also from a council perspective, it'd help us just identify if we have any obligations, right? Because we know in the past, not this administration, but past administrations, we'll get some things, we'll build an apparatus around it, but when the grant runs out, then you know we should consider whether to keep funding it or not. And so I think just sort of a, a chart that almost is on top on the department level would be super helpful. That's a great idea. Yeah, Thank you, appreciate y'all. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chair. Thank you for right, your leadership. Thank you, Council President. President. Um, so quick time check, it is now 2.22. I still have two uh, council members signed up, and I've got a couple questions as well. And I also see green shirts and their annual um, migration to our council chamber. So, and I, I see the Parks Commissioner waiting uh, in, in the wings. But I'll let me All hand right. it over to Council yep. Member Overstreet, and we're, we'll bring this home soon. Okay. Well, thank you, Mayor, and your entire executive team. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank you all for everything that we've mentioned today, your accessibility, um, just your collaboration. Um, you know, uh, we are never satisfied and you <laughs> understand that. And I appreciate that because, um, you know, we can't be, we can't sit back and, and rest like we just can't until it's, it's right. So um, with that, I'm going to go right on into it. Uh, I do, my favorite page of this whole slide, your, your whole slide deck, was the whole of government approach. Mm -hmm. I love that snapshot um, because that is what it requires for us to build equitably in Atlanta. And I love the most the part uh, which, you know, whoever did this, I'm, I'm, I really do love it, uh, where it says resources, relationships, plus partnerships equal results. I agree with that, and that's what it took. Like, we sat at the table together with Invest Atlanta to talk about how we could build more equitably in the city um, because developers are pouring into areas and they're not pouring into some other areas. And we have to use this $12 billion of all of these 
different ways of, of coming up with this funding and, and really making Atlanta the global city that we are supposed to be, we are going to have to figure out how to get a grocery store on Campbellton Road. You knew I was going to say that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Anywhere between the low and county line, anywhere. Like we have to, and I know we can. Uh, what is your appetite for municipal South? Amen. Amen. We're, we're all in on it. That's why you introduced that great piece of legislation That's that we right. have about a tax incentive for grocery stores and food, um, uh, fresh food sources, as well as a fund that has money in it. So we're being very forward with these grocery stores. And at the same time we're looking at grocery stores, we're talking to ourselves about how we can do a municipal market, something as uh, where you can come and get fresh food and groceries. You can also get a meal. Um, um, and it's quality and it's in the gross it's in the uh, areas of need uh, of our city that for some reason grocers just have not found their, their way there and we've been talking to them and they say well we need to have this set of that or this set of this and we're saying well, we're putting our money where our mouth is now what's your excuse and so that's that's the that's that's the posture we're in um, and it's all to make sure that in these underserved areas uh, that don't have their, their food deserts and that affects yeah. their health and it affects their education and yeah, it, affects it affects your community. So we're in, we're in and, and, and it is my commitment that we're going to get a, a grocery store uh, before the, this term is over. You're going to see it. I'm, we're going to be pushing on it hard. And, so on, and I'm on the record for that. And I don't even make grocery stores, but we're going to make one. Yeah, I, <laughs> so, listen, I believe you. Um, and, and same, like I'm here committed to it 100% as well um, because you how did you feel when you read the comments that uh, Dr. Clementich and I have been hearing over these since 2018 actively there's probably not any one or two months that goes by that I'm not trying to get someone to come look at Campbellton and figure out where does a grocery store go how many years is that? That's like five strong five years. years, right? And, and they still say the same notes. We just same. don't see it. It's, it, yeah. it's intolerable. All they are doing is putting in a zip code and saying, you know, we're just, we, we don't see how that's going to survive or thrive. We have the biggest, best cooks in probably the southeastern <clears throat> corridor, period, in southwest Atlanta. Like, we buy groceries and we eat like everybody else. So uh, to, to hear those kind of comments, that motivated me to just never let it go. Mm -hmm. I, I can't, I can't let it go. And then when I looked at this page, this screams what we need. And this is what it takes right here. Um, so um, I appreciate the work that you all have done. I'm so thankful for the legislation that we passed just what, this morning? This morning. <laughs> literally you know this morning um, and looking forward to seeing what that actually looks like um, I'm gonna do a dance I'm I'm sure of it because we, we will have a grocery store on Campbellton um, how do you feel about your your new structure I know we're changing some things around like with city planning and and you know with your your the way you've uh, put together your groups uh, which mm -hmm. I might add I came in skeptical. I thought, oh, okay, you know, we're just going to be, you know, plugging some people in. But you really have done what you should have done. And that is look at every position and then make sure that if processes, like full-blown processes, needed to be changed, you did that. So how do you feel about where you are now and how this budget uh, handles that? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. I feel good about it. I feel like we have enough uh, to get the job done. I think we have the right people um, on the right bus and in the right seats on the bus uh, to go about doing the business of the city. Uh, we're at the right scale. Uh, there was uh, coming in, there were, you know, I think that, you know, how we set up the leadership, it's enough go and push and it's enough tension <laughs> i mean i'm a I, I draw circles and i keep them real really going uh, everybody's in, in in full motion uh we we challenge each other we we literally see your emails when y'all throw darts and shots and tell us you know because a, a citizen said this and we we take it like it's uh it's, it's very serious we don't 
you know, it's the, we might have long-term plans and big projects that we're trying to deliver upon, but, uh, you know, when somebody says there's um, too much trash on this road, uh, we, we take that to heart. We go call the Public Works Commissioner. If there's a problem, uh, we try to solve it, even if it's, you know, um, it, what seems like a small issue or issue that the, the nuts and bolts of government will take care of on its own, we jump in and get going on it as a team. So uh, we're ready. I think, I think we have what we need. And we delivered together last year as we were building this team. So now that we have a full team, imagine how much more we get done. Yeah, um, and so to expound on that a little bit, uh, last week we were at the, uh, was it last week or week before last? We were, last week was the fifth week. So week before that, we were at the older uh, Atlantans a celebration of follies, um, and I was having a conversation with one of the older Atlantans. Uh, your new commissioner, Greg Clay, came up. How are you guys doing? What's happening? She started talking to him about an elevator being out. He gets on the phone immediately and calls uh, Baptist Towers to try to figure out how are we getting this elevator going, like in real time. Um, so you really are putting the right people into place, and for that reason, um, your budget uh, it's fine by me until it's not. <laughs> I'll get you working on them grocery stores. Right? That's right. Until it's not. <laughs> okay. But I, I do. I appreciate everything you all are doing and, Thank you. Um, you know, just keep up the good work. Thank you for your leadership. All right. We've got Lewis, then Westmoreland, and then I'll close it up. And Mayor, I just got the call about the Wi Fi at Roselle Fan. Uh, I know it means nothing. To the folks in my community, it means so much. Our uh, Roselle right. fan was built in the early 90s. To not have Wi-Fi until now is a crazy thing. So I appreciate mm -hmm. you for uh, outfitting that building for Wi-Fi, even the employee. Uh, you and I, we were saying our phone didn't work there. Our phone will work there. So I appreciate you for outfitting our recreation center with Wi-Fi. And lastly, the, uh, the yeah, higher of... Okay. okay, you... you we have Wi-Fi there. You just put it in there. Yeah, we yeah, just yeah. put it in there. We're okay. going to cut it in Because the TV people will say I don't have it. I want you to be clear. Yeah. It, we got Wi-Fi at Roselle Fan now. Yeah, okay. it's, it's such right. a big deal. We're going to cut a ribbon uh, for Good. it. This will be the first time our kids will have, you know, a lot of our kids, they don't have a phone service. So they, right. they get on the phone on the Wi-Fi. So it's a big deal. Uh, we're actually getting three PlayStation 5s in there to, because we got Wi-Fi now. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I also want to give you another kudos. Uh, miss, on Metropolitan Parkway. We know that's a state road, but you just being crafty, you being shifty, uh, finding ways to actually get some of that stuff done because uh, it, we, we, I think it's the so bad, Metropolitan man. Parkway is the worst road in the city of Atlanta, probably in the state of Georgia. Uh, it's a, it, they dug some holes in it that you just fall into. And so I want to say I appreciate you for finding ways to work on that now until the state can repay that. So I appreciate you and Mr. Cavendish for that. And, and lastly, Cleveland Avenue looks so good. So uh, that's Mr. That's Public Works. Uh, Public Works have been on point. We know when they're coming. Uh, they've been sending street sweepers. So I appreciate Commissioner Wiggins. I mean, Commissioner Wiggins. And you sent him over there for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And I'll just uh, give them all a shout out to get Wi-Fi in the building. It takes uh, the par uh, par Parks and Recreation, but it also takes finance and it takes procurement to be able to get all these th things done. They just don't like it. And, 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 and AIM. And, and, and Dean. Uh, yeah. Huh? AIM. And AIM, too. Dean and AIM. Everybody. Actually, everybody. Everybody, <laughs> everybody back there. It, take, it takes AIM for sure. AIM for sure. But I just want to say that, that it takes a lot of people. It's not like just calling your carrier at your house and they just show up whenever the uh, technician can show up. And then Metropolitan Parkway, Cavernous, uh has uh, really drawn a circle with G GDOT uh, because that's not our road, uh, but we uh, have had a communication with them and we filled those potholes. And now, you know, hopefully we will see that uh, uh, all that come to fruition to get it all taken care of. And then um, you talked about, you know, street cleanup. Uh, 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 what am I trying to say? The um, Department of Public Works and uh, Commissioner Wiggins has been working really hard on um, anti-litter. I told them that we want to do an anti-litter campaign. We're getting new big belly trash cans throughout these districts and got an anti-dumping program and he's hiring folks up so that they can do the work of the city, which is to clean up these roads and streets. And uh, so public works, transportation, everybody's working together uh, for the city. And, that, and, and each of those were all, uh, you know, well, two out of the three were recently hired. So they're working together. Thank you. 
All right. You know you got a big person in the seat there because Matt Westmoreland, this is only the second question he's asked or comment he's made during this whole budget proceeding. So, Mr. Westmoreland. Indeed. And it's not a question. It's a comment. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, to you and your team. I just wanted to, Mr. English mentioned it earlier, but since it was on consent last night, I wanted to make sure that we didn't forget that we passed a $100 million housing bond mm -hmm. this year. Not $100 million over 30 years, $100 million this year that follows on the heels of $100 million in 2021, historic investments in housing affordability. And the next budget presentation is going to be about making the biggest investment in green space year over year in 50 years, $16 new million a year in green space investments. So I'd put this administration's record on housing and green space against any other in half a century. So I appreciate the work that you all are doing. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, I get I save the do what he did, for man. We'll be out of here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, um, a couple of just high-level comments and then some data requests rather than gumming up uh, the rest of the proceedings here. I'm on page 20, uh, like Councilmember uh, Collier Overstreet, the whole of government approach. Um, the first bullet, I, I, I think. The $12 billion number is obviously eye-popping, jaw-dropping, and, and really important. I think one of the things, if you've been following the proceedings that you've heard council members talk about, though, is our concerns over capacity to deploy that. It's one thing to have it in the bank and sit on it and have access to it. It's, it's another to translate into completed projects. So infrastructure bond, transportation department. So I'm, I'm hoping that remains a focus on y'all side in terms of execution because it's certainly on ours, um, particularly when you've got some of the money that's eight years old from Renew Atlanta and TSPLOS 1.0, right? So uh, just want to make sure that that, that is, stays on your radar. Um, I think we have opportunities coming up. And while you're talking about transportation infrastructure, I have to quickly put a plug in for the Clifton Corridor and MARTA. But more importantly, I think on the commercial property side, there's a lot of talk in the commercial real, uh, real estate industry right now about if there is a dip due to the new way people use office, is there an opportunity for those with cash, as we would with our reserves, to go in and buy the properties for conversion to affordable housing like we've been doing. So I hope that stays on your radar too and might be a, a really effective use of our capital reserves. You know, the credit rating notwithstanding, um, you know, if we're talking about the long-term sustainability and health of our city and that being a big priority of yours, um, let's not um, lose sight of that piece. Um, and then my final three data, uh, two data uh, Request One has to do with um, Mr. English at your department, um, the notion of um, it being budget neutral. I think it would be helpful for me to be able to see the staff um, and kind of the expenditures and then where it all kind of came from from the other departments. And so, you know, we can't see it because it's all kind of blended into the budget for each one. But if, if there's some sort of diagram or uh, schedule that we can get provided for us, that would be helpful. We can. And, and, and just for the record, the personnel um, budget associated with that office is primary personnel, and it's yeah. about 1.3 million. But we'll give a breakdown of the org structure of that uh, organization as well. Right, that'd be helpful. And then uh, a similar data request has to do with the um, if you take your budget and then back out uh, the 1.3 million, it still represents a nine, um, I think, a nine percent increase in terms of salary from last year to this year. And you attributed part of it to the COLA um, and then others to kind of changes in the personnel structure. So I'm assuming a lot of that will show up in the personnel paper, um, but I just wanted, I, I saw the commissioner of HR in here, so when uh, she comes in to present as well as the personnel paper, hopefully that's something that we can highlight as well um, because um, that will also help explain this, the sharp increrease in your, your numbers. Uh, yeah, I think one short answer, though, is also field vacancies. Yep. So not gotcha. only do you have the COLA, you have the field vacancies, yep. but that makes up for all of it. But we'll make sure to include that. Very good. Okay. Um, yeah, so those, that's just that comment and then those two data requests. Uh, the one thing I will say, too, I mean, one of the questions I always get is, um, how is it this time around being back on council? And, and my answer is you know, uh, unequivocally, I said, for the first time that I've served in this, in this city, it feels like everybody's rowing in the same direction, from the administration over to council. Um, I think that stems from your leadership, your team's kind of philosophy, as well as what you've given us space to do over here as well. And so um, I, I want to offer you the same compliment, just in a different angle. Um, 
it's a lot of fun. I will say that. This is what I think all of us signed up for. We wanted to be able to be part of the sausage making um, and feel like we're doing it in concert with you, not um, in spite of or uh, instead of um, the executive office. So um, I, I offer you that compliment. Thank you for, um, like I said, cr having created that culture here at City Hall. I think we've got a lot ahead of us um, in terms of opportunity and I appreciate your presentation today. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. I feel the same way about each and every last one of you and each of your committees and uh, the teamwork that we have. Uh, my team uh, never gets tired of uh, working with council, never says, you know, anything negative about the, op the uh, administration and council relationship. Uh, this is a team effort. We know we can't get things done without working with y'all. Um, you guys are, you know, hard working. It's a hard working council. You work a lot. You do a lot of things in the community. Um, it makes our job easy when you give us good feedback from the community so that we can make uh, strategic moves and implementation of uh, key initiatives that you have. So uh, we stand ready to serve with you. And, um, you know, I applaud you all for uh, your work yesterday. And, and, I, and I'll say this, you, this is uh, not only what Matt Westmoreland said about all the you know, housing money, the parks, and those other things. We operate right now in the most connected time ever in history. Uh, someone right now is watching us probably on three different formats. People are texting and communicating about everything that we do. Um, division is, is easy when you have this many modes of saying, you know, this person did this or didn't do that or said this, and, and, and complaints are high, higher now than ever before. People, you know, have found a way to uh, complain on a sunny day in the city of Atlanta, um, and then they'll tweet about it, and they won't call you, they'll just tweet. But um, I tell you that in the face of all that, you guys are still um, keeping, keeping the trains on, 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 on schedule, as you will. And I just thank you for that. We are aware of the pressures that you're on, under individually. We're under those same pressures. So when we know we got a teammate that understands that, then that's when we get a lot done. So I thank you to the, your staff as well and to the clerks and everybody that's involved. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, with that, we're going to reset um, as soon as Commissioner Cutler and his team can get up uh, to the, the stage. We're going to get started with Parks and Rec. And colleagues, we'll be on page 233 of the budget book. i got to give her an award away. She's just sitting there? Yeah, she's waiting. She's going to do it in the ceremonial room, right?